Coming up on Bridge City News, a large rally took place in Lethbridge yesterday by those who say they're tired of having their freedoms taken away. The Alberta Union of Provincial Employees speaks out against potential cuts to those who are most vulnerable. And U.S. government officials survey and speak out about the devastating wildfires ravaging the West Coast. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. If you found your drive home down Mayor McGrath Drive was a little noisier than usual yesterday, it was because of a protest by people who said they were fed up with COVID-19 restrictions. Video journalist Naveen Day was there and has the details. A group of about 100 demonstrators assembled at Henderson Lake on Tuesday to protest what they say is an overreach by local and provincial government officials into their personal lives and personal freedoms. Event organizer Michelle Vanderkoy says the province allowed large retailers that sold food and pharmaceuticals to stay open, while small businesses were forced to shut down. We were told that we need to flatten the curve. And we kept hearing that and kept hearing that. And we didn't have mass data or mandated mask uh, bylaws in place uh, when it was when the numbers were at the highest. Um, they weren't mandating masks. And they kept saying, let's flatten the curve, let's flatten the curve. Well, we did flatten the curve. We got it to zero in Lethbridge. And then our city council decides to mandate a mask bylaw. Demonstrators at the rally also felt that the published COVID-19 death numbers were exaggerated and that the demonstration is a counter message to what they say is fear mongering around COVID-19. In the US, uh, several weeks ago, they said 180,000 people died of COVID. And then uh, they, they announced that those numbers were fake. They were, and they came out with only 9,000 people died of COVID. Now, why is that not getting out in the news? That should have shut this thing down immediately. This is a world issue. This is a global issue. Most jurisdictions in the world are dealing with this. And it's important to look at it as a global issue and to act locally, to think globally and act locally. And uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, general average people are not being asked. We haven't been asked our opinion of things. We weren't consulted in the lockdown. We weren't consulted uh, in the social distancing. All kinds of things have been put in place without any uh, public input. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. A new poll by Lenny Chase says many Canadians believe the threat of COVID-19 is overblown. Close to 25% said they believe public officials and government officials exaggerate their warnings, including the need to physically distance. Across the country, Albertans were most likely to believe the threat was embellished, followed by Atlantic Canada and Quebec. Ontario was near the bottom. According to the survey, younger people under the age of 55 believed statements were over-exaggerated. The online poll was conducted September 11th through the 13th and surveyed just over 1,500 people across the country. The Alberta government came out with its new COVID-19 numbers today. The province says we've seen an increase of 171 cases over the past 24 hours, giving us a total number of 1,495 active cases. There are currently 34 active coronavirus cases here in the South Zone. Sadly, 254 people have died from the virus, but the good news is that across the province, 14,379 people have also recovered from COVID-19. Across Canada, 122,000 have recovered from the virus, leaving us with around 18,000 active cases. At the close of a two-day federal cabinet retreat, Heritage Minister Stephen Jubot says the Liberals' focus is still on the COVID-19 pandemic and dealing with a new second wave. He says his party has also not forgotten about dealing with climate change. Clearly, the priority has to be making sure that we get COVID under control and we protect and support Canadians to make it through this crisis. This is, this is clearly a priority. As the Prime Minister has said before, I mean, there is a health crisis, but that doesn't mean that the climate crisis is going away. Uh, we have public health authorities in British Columbia telling people not to go outside and exercise because of record level forest fires in the United States. So we, we can't ignore what's happening, but, but we have a very clear problem with, with, with COVID right now. It, it, but it, it does also mean that, that we have to plan in terms of how, once we can start talking about the recovery, what does it, what does it look like? The daughter of a man who died of COVID-19 in Vancouver paid tribute to him yesterday. A special memorial was set up featuring a poster, a physiotherapist, Gary Moncton, 
who passed away April 2nd. His daughter, Samantha, says it's a reminder of how the virus has impacted so many. You would not be here because the old people made you. <laughs> they brought you up. You have a duty to keep your elders safe because you're going to be old one day too. And you will hope that people will respect you and take care of you and keep you safe. And that's the best thing you can do, really. It's the most kindest thing you can do. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney announced that his government will look at criteria to determine if people will be able to qualify for a shirt income for the severely handicapped. The Alberta Union of Provincial Employees is putting out a call to the UCP government saying that they think it's a heartless government that doesn't care about struggling Albertans who are just trying to access help during these difficult times. Absolutely uh, heartless, inconsiderate, uh, non-compassionate way to treat um, some of the most vulnerable members of our society. Uh, Jason Kenney has determined that obviously people who consider themselves severely handicapped and it's not those citizens that consider themselves severely handicapped. It is trained professionals, uh, AUPE members, that have done proper assessments to determine um, the uh, credibility of, of every claim to uh, those benefits by uh, the 70,000 Albertans that now um, sit on AISH benefits. In a news conference yesterday, Premier Jason Kenney said that as long as people qualify for AISH, they will not lose their benefits. As many Albertans struggle financially during the coronavirus pandemic, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation says Alberta's Finance Minister Travis Taves needs to take tax hikes off the table. According to the CTF, more than 160,000 Albertans have lost their jobs since February. Thousands of small business owners are at risk of closing down their businesses for good. Franco Terrazano is the Alberta Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, and he joins me now from Calgary. Now, Franco, in order to help us get back to black in a balanced book, are you saying it should be more about cuts and less taxes? Well, the finance minister needs to take tax hikes off the table. Albertans can't afford tax hikes. I mean, we still know that so many Alberta families are, are struggling right now. We've seen so many Albertans who work outside of government who have lost their job or have taken pay cuts. They can't afford tax hikes. And, and businesses, uh, businesses can't afford tax hikes either. We need our businesses worried about getting their people back to work, not worried about whether the government's going to be reaching deeper into their, into their pockets with tax, tax hikes. And so that's why we need Finance Minister Travis Taves to, to focus on cutting the $10 billion spending problem and not increasing taxes. Now, you've also gone on record saying that Ottawa needs to rein in spending. You say that the Liberal government could save around $30 billion every year by having both MPs and senators take salary cuts? Having our MPs and our politicians taking salary cuts is, is part of those savings. And, and look, Albertans, we can't afford higher taxes from a provincial government, and we can't afford higher taxes uh, from Ottawa either. And, and really what we need to see is we need to see leadership, and that starts at the top. And that means we need to see our politicians saying they're willing to uh, share the tough times with the many workers uh, who have been struggling and, and take some pay cuts. That was Franco Terrazano, Alberta Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, joining me from Calgary. The Alberta government announced that it will be improving our provincial parks while creating 290 new jobs. The province says that $43 million will go towards upgrades and repairs. The highest sum, $15 million, will be spent on parks in the Kananaskis region outside of Calgary. Calgary's Fish Creek Park will also receive $480,000 over three years for conservation work and visitor programming. As for remote park sites, Environment Minister Jason Nixon says they will not be closing but delisted in a better way to manage them. Since the provincial government cut funding to Arches and our city's supervised consumption site, all of their programs have been cancelled. All except for one, the Indigenous Recovery Program. That initiative is federally funded and aims to extend a hand to those struggling with addiction through the opioid crisis. As Ainsley O'Reilly explains, recovery is complex and the pathway to healing many times begins with a conversation and a hot meal. The government of Alberta hasn't released recent data on overdose deaths. But local advocacy groups say the opioid crisis continues to be lethal, especially within the Indigenous community. Some argue that these deaths are being overlooked. The Indigenous Recovery Program in Lethbridge is hoping to remind people to treat everyone with dignity, especially those with addictions. These lives out here matter just as much, you know. And the problem, it's not, you know, yes, it's, it's a tough problem, but um, they would see a lot more success 
if we had more support. Knowing and hearing some of their stories of what they've been through and um, why they got into this cycle is, is very, it's very um, painful to be honest. I don't know why I get weepy eyed when I talk about this stuff, but I think because it, 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 we, we're, we do such a good job tearing ourselves away from our human selves and we do that for other people. We, we rip away that humanity as if they're not, they're non-human and so it allows us to be more hurtful and hateful towards them. With COVID-19 separating the IRP from its clients, the group is hoping to re-engage. Every Wednesday, they set up a teepee in Galt Gardens and hand out a hot meal. This week, it was chili and fried bannock. So cooking definitely does bring, um, bring our, our people to us, right? So that's one thing, you know, that we, we love is, is food. <laughs> in the short term, the group is hoping to expand its staff. But in the long term, recovery coach Joey Blood hopes to end the opioid epidemic. It'd be nice to not be to not be an indigenous recovery coach that's the goal for us someday that our program doesn't have to exist anymore because our people are taken care of you know for bridge city news i'm ainsley o'reilly belting choruses to new heights but from behind a computer that was the idea for the vox music choral society last night as they held their first rehearsal of the season via zoom as Micah Quinn explains now, the members say this was quite the experience for them and it was great to be back singing. From rehearsing in person to online rehearsals through Zoom, that's the reality for the Vox Musica Choral Society. For music director Joanne Collier, this meant looking at an empty church with empty pews. That was very different, but I just really tried to put myself into the mindset that and imagining that they were just there a few feet away from me and uh, trying to uh, respond to what I was asking them to do and, and what I sensed they were doing. So that's very, very different. Collier says there is a real sense of community when she directs. And the fabulous music, like the great masterful music that we sing is such a vehicle for fostering that in a group of, a group of singers. And uh, that was more easily achievable last night than I thought it would be. One of the unique aspects of the Choral Society is that it's a non-audition choir. So we have members who don't have a lot of background in music, but who are there because they love to sing. And they sing maybe with their church choirs, or they, they sang in university, or they sang when they were in high school. Or, I mean, we have members who um, just wanted that something to be a part of. The Vox Musica Choral Society says they may consider having a live stream once they are finally able to get back to meeting and rehearsing in person. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Federal Finance Minister Christian Freeland says it is good news for Canada that the United States dropped tariffs against imports of Canadian aluminum. Freeland says if the tariffs are reimposed in the future, Canada will retaliate once again. Should tariffs be reimposed on our aluminum exports in the future, Canada will retaliate with perfectly reciprocal dollar-for-dollar dollar tariffs, as we have done in the past. We will always stand up for our workers and our industry. We will always stand up for the national interest. The throne speech will be taking place on September the 23rd. Many political insiders believe that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will discuss ushering in massive changes, which will mean massive spending. I asked political reporter Brian Lilly what some of those changes may look like. When he says massive change, he's really talking about massive social program spending, national pharmacare, national child care, a universal basic income, issues that are actually all fundamentally provincial jurisdiction. But he's going to show up with a pot of money and dare the opposition parties to vote him down and, and call an election. And if they do, then he's going to turn around and say, uh, okay, well, I'm ready to give you all this money, and, and they're not. Mr. Lilly will have more on what the Liberals are wanting to spend our tax dollars on coming up after business news. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller says the long-awaited National Action Plan on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is coming soon. He says, however, that the federal government is not the only player. Ottawa is also receiving input from the provinces, territories, and various Indigenous organizations. What the MMIW 
G report um, underlined was that this is something that is a, a national plan, it's not only a federal plan. And uh, there are a number of elements that, uh, that need to be done in the short term, in the medium term, and, and in the long term. Um, that was the spirit behind the, the interim um, release that, that the Minister Bennett um, put forth about a year ago. Uh, and the work has to continue. It has to continue with partners. That includes uh, partners at AFN, um, various uh, civil society groups, and all those, uh, all those, all those important commentary and views have to be put together in a cohesive document. Um, it takes work from the provinces and the territories to come forth with uh, with their recommendations. That Joe Biden's running mate, Senator Kamala Harris, surveyed the wildfire damage in her home state of California. She says ideology should not kick in when responding to the devastating wildfires. It's, this is just a fact. And we have to do better as a country. It is incumbent on us, uh, in terms of the leadership of, of, of our nation, to take seriously the extreme changes in our climate and to do what we can to mitigate against the damage, but also what we must do to preserve the beautiful land um, that we have inherited from prior generations. The Canadians helping to beat back California's wildfires are getting relief this week, but some of the replacements are headed to Oregon instead. 60 firefighters from Quebec have spent the past two weeks helping to bring Northern California's North Complex blaze under control. Officials are now saying that two of three Canadian relief crews will instead go to Oregon, where fires have killed at least eight people and scorched more than 4,000 square kilometers. Very poor air quality is impacting much of British Columbia, including Vancouver, Victoria, and the Okanagan Valley. Now, the smoke from the wildfires south of the border is also causing major issues for those most vulnerable in Washington State, Oregon, and California. The governor of Washington State says for him, it's all about climate change. When those conditions exist, I believe we have a responsibility to speak up. I think we're doing the right thing in our state, which is leading the nation away from more climate fires and towards more climate clean energy jobs. That's a good future for our state, I think. The president is using this as an excuse, an excuse for inaction against something we do know is a problem, which is climate change. Nobody, is, nobody that I know of is arguing that we shouldn't do some of this uh, fuels management program on our forest lands. Nobody's arguing that. That has a place in this. There's no question about it. But by using that as an excuse to ignore this mortal danger of climate change, is inexcusable. You can actually see some of the smoky haze in the River Valley earlier today in Lethbridge. Environment Canada says our air quality is currently at 2, which is low risk. But what will the rest of the week look like? Full air and weather details are coming up. We had some smoke and haze today with the air quality of 2, which is low risk. And Environment Canada says more smoke may move in tomorrow, increasing the risk to 3. Moderate air quality is 4 to 6, reading so, so far it's not so bad. Tonight expect a little more haze, clouds and a low near 7 degrees. Tomorrow expect light haze with a high near 19. Friday mainly sunny with a high of 23. A low pressure system returns on Saturday, bringing more clouds and a temperature of 21. Sunday expect rain with a high of 17. Monday, a mixture of sun and cloud with a high near 24. Tuesday, slightly cooler with a high of 20. Looking at the Almanac, the average high for this time of year is 20 degrees with an average low of 5. The highest temperature in the state was recorded in 1938 at 32 degrees. And the record low was a chilly minus 4 in 1969. Sunrise was at 7.09, sunset at 7.43. Looking at tomorrow's national forecast now, the special air quality statement continues for much of BC on Thursday. Expect more smoky conditions with a high near 21 for both Vancouver and Victoria. Just a few clouds and 19 for Calgary tomorrow. Expect lots of sunshine and a high of 18 for Edmonton. A mixture of sun and cloud and 14 for both Saskatoon and Regina. Clearing and 14 degrees for Winnipeg. Lots of blue sky sunshine and 18 for Toronto tomorrow. Just a few clouds and 16 degrees for Ottawa. Mostly cloudy and 18 for Montreal. In the Maritimes, expect light showers and 23 for Fredericton. Just a few clouds at 23 as well for Halifax. Rain at 22 degrees for Charlottetown. And at St. John's, Newfoundland, you should see lots of sunshine tomorrow in a high near 21. Canada's annual inflation rate came in lower than expected last month as gasoline prices dropped just over 11% from the same period last year. Stats Canada says the inflation rate was 0.1%, which was unchanged from July. 
Economists had been expecting year-over-year consumer price increase of 0.4% for August. Now, excluding gas, the annual inflation rate last month was 0.6%. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development says the global economy is not as bad as many thought, especially in the U.S. and China. In today's report, the OECD says the world economy is only expected to shrink 4.5% this year. That was less than the 6% which was predicted in June. The group says the global economy should rebound and grow by about 5% next year, but cautions that its outlook is subject to considerable uncertainty. The U.S. Federal Reserve left interest rates near zero and said it would keep them there until at least 2023 to help the U.S. economy recover from the coronavirus pandemic. The Open Market Committee says it anticipates maintaining an accommodative stance of monetary policy until it achieves inflation, which should average about 2% over time. The Fed said it is committed to using all of the tools necessary to support economic recovery. That includes buying $80 billion worth of treasuries and $40 billion worth of mortgage-backed securities each month. Kraft Heinz is selling its natural cheese business, including Cracker Barrel, to a French dairy company like Talis Group. The $3.2 billion sale includes Kraft Heinz production facilities in California, New York and Wisconsin, which employs around 750 people. The company will retain the Philadelphia cream cheese brand, Kraft Singles, along with the Velveeta and Cheese Whiz brands. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 135 points in the day to finish at 16,295. The Dow was up 36 points to 28,032. The S&P 500 was down 15 points to 3,385. And the Nasdaq was down 139 points to 11,050. Oil was up $1.90 to $40.18 per barrel. Natural gas was down 11 cents to 225. Gold was down 6 cents to 1959.20 an ounce. And silver was unchanged on the day at 27.16 an ounce. Wheat is at $232 per metric ton. Barley's at $230. Canola's at 524. And corn is at $246 per metric ton. Live cattle were down 38 cents to 106.73. Peter cattle were down a buck 28 to 142.43, and lean hogs were down 48 cents to 65.23. The Canadian dollar was down slightly on the day to 75.88 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, a new poll by Leger says many Canadians believe the threat of COVID-19 is overblown. Close to 25% say they believe public health and government officials exaggerate their warnings, including the need to physically distance. Across the country, Albertans were most likely to believe the threat was embellished, followed by Atlantic Canada and Quebec. Ontario was near the bottom. Close to 5,000 people marched in the streets of Ottawa recently protesting the Liberals' gun ban. Toronto journalist Brian Lilly will have details next. But first, here's look what's happening in and around your community. Here is your Bridge City News community calendar. Lethbridge Arts Days 2020 is taking place September 24th to the 27th. This is an annual celebration held in conjunction with Provincial and National Culture Days. This year's events and activities will be available online as well as in person with physical distancing requirements being observed. Connect with artists in our community and come celebrate the arts in Lethbridge. For more information, visit artslethbridge.org. Lethbridge's Sport Council's Outdoor Roving Gyms program is taking place Mondays and Wednesdays from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. behind Nicholas Sharon Arena. This program is for kids ages 5 and under and their caregivers. Come and enjoy an hour of fun and get active. For details and to register, visit lethbridgesportcouncil.ca slash roving gyms. Bring your lunch and enjoy beautiful live music at the same time. Come out October 2nd to the first Friday Lunch and Listen concert series featuring performances by the University of Lethbridge Conservatory of Music in Cass's Community Room beginning 12.15 p.m. and ending at 1. First Friday events are an initiative brought to you by the Heart of Our City Committee. For a full listing of upcoming events, visit firstfridaylethbridge.com. And that's your Bridge City News Community Calendar. The Trudeau cabinet has been taking part in a retreat over the past few days, planning out the new throne speech slated for September 23rd. Now, one of the things we've not heard is that the government has not consulted with opposition parties, despite promising massive change. To talk more about it, it's one of our regular contributors, journalist Brian Lilly, joining me once again from Toronto. Brian, is this part of the new normal? Well, 
is it part of the new normal, part of the old normal? Is it Justin Trudeau being what he said he wouldn't be? I mean, we have to remember this is a, a prime minister who did not win the popular vote in the last election. He got more than 250,000 votes fewer than the Conservatives, but he did win more seats, but not a majority. This is a government that, you know, was elected the first time talking about being uh, respectful of parliament and consulting other parties and you know n not just ramming things through and here we are in the middle of a pandemic with the government that won 33 percent of the popular vote last time at a time when most you know voter turnout was not a hundred percent i believe i've seen it estimated at about 22 percent of canadians voted for the Liberals to be in power. Out of all eligible voters, 22% voted for them to be in power. So maybe you'd think that they would reach out to the Conservatives, to the New Democrats, to the Bloc Québécois and say, look, we're looking at doing some massive changes. We think that there are ways to, uh, you know, uh, come back from this pandemic and this recession that will make Canada better. We'd like you on side. They haven't consulted a single opposition leader. And when asked about it, the prime minister just said, oh, we've been consulting all the time, just not on, well, the throne speech or the budget or any of the big changes that we're going to be bringing in. Now, some of the massive changes usually means a massive price tag, which means a little more spending of our taxpayers' dollars here. Brian, we already have a debt of over a trillion dollars, our deficit $343 billion. The Parliamentary Budget Office and the big banks said this cannot continue. But Justin Trudeau thinks that it can, and and he wants to. And it would be difficult for Aaron O'Toole and the Conservatives, who are the main opposition party. I've you know, been looking at some recent polling that shows the NDP still not doing well, so they're not going to be a threat to the Liberals. But it would be very difficult for Aaron O'Toole and the Conservatives to come out and start talking about cutting at this point, or saying, we need to return to a balanced budget. Even voters who are conservative-minded aren't ready to start saying, we need to get back to balance yet. So Justin Trudeau is finding that sweet spot with the voters and saying, I'm going to give you a lot more money. When he says massive change, he's really talking about massive social program spending, national pharmacare, national child care, a universal basic income, issues that are actually all fundamentally provincial jurisdiction. But he's going to show up with a pot of money and dare the opposition parties to vote him down and, and call an election. And if they do, then he's going to turn around and say, oh, OK, well, I'm ready to give you all this money. And, and they're not. So that's kind of the setup that we're looking at as we head towards the throne speech and the budget next week. It, you know, it, it really does put Aaron O'Toole in a tough spot. Now, all of this theater with the throne speech, with promises of more spending, is being seen as a bit of a backdrop for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to set up an election and possibly get a majority. But Brian, some say the threat of a fall election is fading now. Do you buy that? Not really. Uh, I, I get where some of the, the analysts that are coming from, um, you know, why they're saying that. They're saying, look, uh, numbers of COVID-19 are up in various parts of the country. We've seen them rise in Ontario. We've seen uh, some rise in Quebec. Alberta, British Columbia, there, you know, it, it's not a spike, but it's a trickle and it's not a good trend. Let's put it that way. But Blaine Higgs, the premier of New Brunswick, just, you know, won more seats. He's got a stronger majority now than he did before. So if you're Justin Trudeau, you're looking at that and saying, OK, am I able to parlay what we've got uh, in terms of a, a weak minority into a strong majority. I mean, he's been governing as if he has the strongest majority ever. Uh, he, he's consulting less than a majority government of any stripe would in the past. It, it is at times he is announcing massive spending programs from the podium. Parliamentarians don't hear about them. Premiers that have to end up dealing with them don't hear about them until he utters the words from the podium. So he could look at this and say, you know what? We've got a really good window here. Let's go. Middle of August, I was reporting on a campaign research poll that, um, that I had that showed that the, the Liberals were down at 30% in the polls. The we scandal had driven people into the undecided columns. They weren't voting Conservative. They weren't voting NDP. But if an election had been had you know, back in the middle of August when the we scandal was going on, 
the liberals would have been in trouble. They, they very well could have lost the election. Well, what did they do a few days after that first of many polls showing them losing support came out? They prorogued parliament. They shut down the wee committees. They took it off the front pages. They stopped making it the biggest story on television and radio newscasts. And guess what? Now we've got polls showing, the, well, the first one, again, campaign research uh, provided to, to me showing the liberals at 40%. Stellar support in Atlantic Canada, stronger support in Ontario and Manitoba, uh, stronger support in Alberta than in Saskatchewan, where they're in single digits. But, uh, you know, they could end up winning a bunch more seats in a stronger majority than they had in 2015 if they are you know, able to keep this type of support and head to the polls. Is it thanks to a lot of the spending that the Trudeau Liberals have done during the pandemic? And speaking with pollster Nick Cavallis, I put that question to him and just said, okay, um, you know, are Canadians really behind all this? And his answer was enough Canadians are behind it, that it would lead to a Trudeau majority. That and the NDP is not doing well. Uh, the NDP is down at around 15% support. So to give you the top line numbers, Hal, 40% for the, the Liberals, 30% for the Conservatives, 15% for the NDP, and then the, the, uh, the Greens are at seven and the Bloc is at six. Those are numbers that spell strong majority for the Liberals. Um, again, mostly frozen out across the prairies, well, except for Manitoba, where I think they would win back a lot of the seats they lost last time. Brian, Leslie Lewis impressed many people with her run during the Tory leadership race. Now Lewis announced that she's seeking a seat. Where will she run? She's going to run in Haldeman, Norfolk, which is um, quite a ways from Toronto. If, you know, for people that know the area, well, probably not a whole lot of people know the area. It's a rural uh, township. It's two rural counties uh, on the shores of Lake Erie. Probably the most famous place there is Port Dover. I grew up going to the beach at Port Dover on the weekends when I was a kid. Uh, if you ever see the, uh, you know, on TV news, you see the uh, uh, Friday the 13th biker rally that happens there. It's massive. And that's where she's going to run. Port Dover is one of the, the, the big towns in Haldeman, Norfolk. It's a safe conservative seat. It's been held since, I think, 2004. Um, maybe a little bit earlier, but I think at least since 2004 by Diane Finley. Uh, she was uh, Minister of Immigration, Minister of Employment Services under Stephen Harper. Her late husband was Senator Doug Finley, who was a political operative that helped the Harper Conservatives win in multiple elections. Uh, she has uh, announced that she is no longer running. It's a real loss for the Conservatives to, to lose Diane Finley. She's a smart woman. Uh, you might recognize her from her glasses. She wears uh, sunglasses all the time, dealing with Graves' disease. But Leslyn Lewis, an up-and-comer in the party, uh, someone who impressed an awful lot of people and who will fit right in with the people of Haldeman, Norfolk. You know, it's interesting. You're right. I've been there many times with my family in Port Dover and all the motorcyclists, not even Friday the 13th. And so Leslyn Lewis knows how to run, but does she know how to ride? That's probably the more <laughs> important question, right? And does she like perch with her fish and chips? Because that's, that's the... Right. <laughs> now, Brian, the Trump administration <laughs> withdrew the imposed tariffs on Canadian aluminum. Did it have something to do with Canada's $3.6 billion in countermeasures? You know, I, I would like to think it might. And the fact that those countermeasures might come in, and I'd like to think some strong diplomacy from our ambassador in the United States, from, uh, from others in the Liberal government, I'm going to give them high marks on this. Uh, we were all surprised when the tariffs came in previously. Uh, when Donald Trump put in tariffs on aluminum and steel, there was a lot of, of well, telegraphing that this was coming. Uh, this most recent go round with the aluminum tariffs, it, it, it kind of caught a lot of people off guard. And then the withdrawal kind of caught a lot of people off guard. They were supposed to, uh, the, the Trudeau government, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Christy Freeland was supposed to announce a number of countermeasures on Tuesday afternoon. Her press conference delayed a bit because, well, let's adjust and announce that, well, those tariffs aren't happening. So uh, high marks for the Trudeau government on this file, absolutely. Brian, despite the border being closed to non-essential travel, we continually see the Pearson International Airport in Mississauga, just outside of Toronto, receive the most COVID-19 infected international flights. How is this possible during a pandemic? 
because we're still taking back Canadians and I don't think that they're fully enforcing border measures uh, when it comes to international flights. They restricted flights uh, internationally to four airports, uh, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, and Calgary. Um, in, since August 31st, Pearson has received 21 different flights. Pearson Airport in Toronto, 21 different flights uh, with people infected from COVID-19. They come from places like India, Chicago, um, Istanbul, uh, you know, a variety of countries, Zurich, Switzerland, I believe there was a flight from. Uh, they can't all be Canadians coming back. In some cases, in a couple of the flights from India, that was the case because they were charters bringing back Canadians uh, who had been stranded in India during uh, the pandemic. But in all these cases, they can't just be Canadians coming back. I, I fail to believe that that's the case. By the way, after that, I believe the order goes in. I don't have all the numbers in front of me on my screen, but I believe it goes Vancouver, then Calgary, then Montreal. Uh, and there's also flights going back and forth across the country of Canadians flying between destinations within this country who are arriving and then they get scanned, they get tested and oops, you, you've got COVID-19. So we're still spreading it around. I can tell you that you know, we've seen uh, an uptick. Uh, Monday, there were 313 new cases in Ontario, 251 on Tuesday. They were saying, oh, well, we've got to close restaurants. We've got to close bars. And the public health officials said, no, it's mostly coming from parties. And by the way, there's a good chunk of it. It's people traveling within Canada, going back and forth. Maybe they're doing a road trip for the weekend to Montreal or they're I don't know, driving to Winnipeg. I, I don't know where they're going, but they're traveling within the country and coming back with COVID-19. Brian, during a recent meeting with Quebec Premier Francois Legault, new Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole said the Energy East pipeline is off the table. And Alberta Premier Jason Kenney is understandably upset upon hearing the news. Yeah, this is a bit of an odd one because I get where Aaron O'Toole is coming from in saying that Energy East is off the table. Uh, the proponent of that pipeline was TransCanada, now TC Energy. They're not interested in building it anymore. And guess what? Nobody else is interested in building a west to east pipeline at this point. We had line nine, uh, which was reversed and brought uh, Alberta oil down to southern Ontario at the least. A and then some of it uh, moved on towards Quebec. But the idea of an energy east uh, pipeline going from uh, Fort McMurray all the way to the ref refineries in New Brunswick was opposed by Quebec. The Trudeau government in 2016-17 put on a bunch of new conditions that effectively saw TransCanada walk away and say, we're not dealing with this. I mean, they put conditions on this pipeline that other pipelines, like the, the natural gas energy Saguenay pipeline, which takes Western Canadian natural gas to the Saguenay for export, they never had to deal with the same stringent rules as Energy East. So, it was the Trudeau government that shot it down. I think it's unfair to criticize O'Toole at this point in saying that he's abandoning Western Canada. If there was somebody proposing a West to East pipeline and he was saying that, I would understand. But at this point, when nobody wants to do this, I, I think it's a bit of an unfair shot. Hopefully somebody comes up with this idea once Aaron O'Toole is in power and then it can actually happen. You know, instead we'll take our oil and we'll take just over a month, go through the Panama Canal to make our way to the East Coast. <laughs> I guess well, you know, he did, say, he did say he'd like to bring back Northern Gateway, uh, which was shut down despite a lack of opposition. So it was just opposed in the Liberal caucus. Yeah. Last weekend, close to 5,000 people marched in the streets of Ottawa and rallied on Parliament Hill against the Trudeau Liberal gun ban. What was their message? And Brian, will it be heard by those in power? Their main message was that uh, the Trudeau Liberals are off target with this gun ban, that it won't reduce gun crime. Look, gun crime is something that we should all be concerned about. But unfortunately, the current government at the federal level looks at trying to solve the issue by going after guns and not by going after crime. Their entire gun ban is to ban rifles many of which are hunting rifles. Yes, there's the AR-15 and, and there's other black plastic scary looking rifles. There's also an awful lot of shotguns and bolt action rifles being added to this list that are used for hunting, hunting elk across the prairies, let's say. Those are being banned and, and it makes zero sense. You know, I, I, last week I talked to a guy named Marcel Wilson who has, you know, in, in the past, he's been out of the gang life for about 16 years now, but he was a, 
a user of these guns, a seller of these guns, and a smuggler of these guns, the guns used in the actual gun crime. Guess what? They're handguns. He tells me that they will have zero impact, this ban. Zero impact. It's not going to stop the, the, the uh, gangsters shooting up the streets in Toronto or Vancouver or Calgary or Lethbridge. And they tend to use handguns. And, and this gun ban doesn't deal with that at all. By the way, Toronto Police Service is the only one in the country that provides up-to-date, real-time stats on a weekly basis for shootings. Between May 1st, when Justin Trudeau introduced his gun ban, and the Labor Day weekend, shootings were up 12.5%. Compared to the same time period in 2018, they were up 24%. And compared to 2015, the summer he got elected, or the, the year he got elected, they're up 83%. So this gun ban's not going to work. It's not going to accomplish what they want. So a, a good, strong message from the folks marching in Ottawa, but I'm not sure it's going to be heard. Brian, we have about 10 seconds left here quickly. Did Calgary Tory MP Michelle Rempel present her anti-gun ban online petition, the largest in Canadian history in Parliament yet? Uh, it has not been presented in Parliament yet because Parliament has uh, not been sitting, but it, it did finish off, It's I believe it's a six-month turn, and she will be able to present that once the House comes back. Largest petition, e-petition in Canadian history. One of our regular contributors, Brian Lilly from Sun Media, joining me once again from Toronto. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you. We are living in unprecedented times of physical, emotional, and spiritual battles that can cause fear, anxiety, and even depression. These can take a terrible toll on our bodies, minds, and our souls. Many believe that in order to win these battles, we need to learn how to protect ourselves with biblical spiritual principles. Joining me now to talk about it is Adam Davis, a former police officer and author of the book called On Spiritual Combat. Welcome to Bridge City News, Adam. Thank you so much for having me on today. What a great time to be alive. Amen, it sure is. Tell me about this book on spiritual combat. What prompted you to write it? You know, my, my co-author and I, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, this was really uh, a project that was based on his book that sold over 500,000 copies on combat. So we wanted to take the psychological and physiological principles from that book and look at what the scripture says. What does God's word have to say about deadly force encounters? What does it say about combat? What does it say about preparing? So we wanted to provide some basic tools. Think of this like spiritual warfare training 101. Like you go to basic police academy or basic training for military. Your first day, your first three months is learning the essentials. So that's what we want, really wanted to do was provide some insight. And this was just based on some conversations we've had with, with uh, first responders and military service members across the globe. And uh, this is, it's been very well received. So Adam, oftentimes we don't really prepare ourselves for a tragedy. How can we do so with not being overly consumed with fear and anxiety? Yeah, I'll tell you what, fear, you know, there, there's a study out, and, and I don't have the exact link to that right now, but I can get it to you. There's a study out that shows that our brains, the same trigger in our mind that responds to drug addiction uh, and other forms of addiction responds to fear the same way. So if we are understanding that hope, it can be more addictive than fear that we have to be intentional about spending time in God's word, spending time in prayer and having a lifestyle that is a lifestyle of worship, literally a lifestyle that honors him and everything we do. We understand that the enemies come to give, uh, to kill, to still destroy. God sent his son, Jesus. He sent his son to give us abundant life. So practical principles puts into place that his word is the answer we need. A relationship with Jesus is the answer we need. But if we take these principles and say, how does this relate psychologically how does this relate with our actions and our contribution in society then that means that we take the principles of his word we prepare ourselves through uh, time and worship and studying the word and knowing how to respond to conflict and tragedy jesus told us in this world you will have trouble it wasn't you may have trouble he said you will have trouble but take heart i've overcome the world he is the only answer and when we have a relationship with him and his word abides in us and we in him, we become more than conquerors in a world run by the enemy. Now, you worked as a police officer, Adam. Tell me about your experience dealing with people who suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, there's this a lot of people that deal with this. And a lot of times we limit that description to individuals who have served in some capacity, whether a first responder or military. But it also applies to individuals 
who have been sexually abused or traumatized or abused of some other form. And we, we often neglect those things. Uh, at the age of five, I was sexually abused. I talked about that openly. Didn't address it for 20 years, nearly 20 years before I addressed it because I wanted to hold on to that pain. I was afraid of dealing with it. I didn't want to address it. And so you deal with the exposure that first responders, specifically in the case that I'm talking about, law enforcement officers, that they deal with day in and day out. Let me tell you something. Human beings were never created to see or experience the things that our men and women of law enforcement deal with day in and day out. The violence, the evil, the hate, they were not intended. They were not created to, to, to witness that, to see it, to deal with it. But through proper training and equipping ourselves with his word, we're still human beings. We're still human beings. And we try to carry those things in our own strength and power. So when we rely on the strength of God with the wisdom, the peace that only he can give us, then we can become more effective in our job. It's a, it's a dangerous, delicate situation. We shouldn't stereotype people if they have a, de, uh, you know, a, a designation or a diagnosis, rather, of post-traumatic stress. Uh, we should show them more care. And there should be systems in place where first responders are uh, taken care of, not just for that incident, but for life. You, we should take care of them if they are serving our communities and it has an effect on them. And we have to do a better job of holding uh, elected officials and appointed officials accountable and taking care of our public servants. So with some of the struggles you've been through, I mean, you were assaulted, you, you said it at a very young age, also as a police officer, some of the things you must have witnessed. Did you struggle with PTSD yourself? Tell me about that journey. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I, I woke up, I had night sweats, I had nightmares, uh, panic attacks, uh, all, the, all the symptoms. Now, I never, I never went to a doctor and, and received a diagnosis, but I can tell you all the symptoms were there. I could go through all the list of things. And how we respond to stress and traumatic uh, experiences uh, often looks like uh, bad behavior or being reckless or things of that nature because we're constantly chasing this, this, uh, this uh, chemical reaction uh, that our bodies have when we're dealing with uh, high stress situations. So for me, it was a case of uh, what do, how do I respond to this? Because I get to the point where deep down in here, I feel hopeless and completely useless because I feel broken. Warriors aren't supposed to feel this way. We're supposed to be invincible. And that's just not the case. We have to come to the understanding that we're human beings. And the reason Jesus came for us is because we're broken. And without him, we're nothing. And so when I began to see, I can't do this on my own. I can't carry this burden on my own. It become overwhelming and crushing. And it was just various experiences. I was never uh, shot. I was never uh, stabbed. I never took anybody's life. But it was just constantly seeing the evil around us and, and some other incidents that I was a part of. Uh, I found myself not sleeping well. I found myself waking up with nightmares, you know, drenched in sweat, uh, panicking and, and not responding well in different situations and even shutting down and, and sort of zoning out when I was with my family. How much did your family help you? Tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. My, my wife was, um, she was an absolute divine uh, appointment for me. She, she demonstrated the unconditional love of Christ because she would sit and want to talk to me when I come home from my shift. I'm, sh I'm totally you know, shut down. So understanding how to address these things from a spouse perspective look at what signs to look for, look at what sort of flag, red flags to look for, and then how to address them. And so that's very important that we do have those conversations, and, and that's probably something for a later date. But certainly uh, she helped me by not pushing me. And I'll tell you a real quick story. I know that you're limited on time, but towards the end of my career in law enforcement, she recognized these things. And so on a, on a Friday, I got off, I got off duty, and I come home and she said, my mom is keeping the kids. We've got uh, a lodge arranged for us in, in a place away, from, about six hours away. And so we went to the mountains. We went horseback riding. We spent time away. She said, I recognize that you were, you, were, you were exhausted and you needed a break. So recognizing that and taking those steps and just listening to me and being there and being present. And sometimes we're hard to love when we're going through those things and understanding that that's when we need you the most. Horseback riding sounds like a lot of fun right now, especially up by the mountains. It does. <laughs> now, what's your message, Adam, to people who are struggling with the impact of tragedy in their lives? Yeah. Let me tell you, my tragedy 
your tragedy are different. They're all, they're all different. But let me tell you what isn't the what isn't different. That's the pain we feel inside. That pain we feel is the same. It's deep and it's overwhelming. And sometimes it feels like you can't breathe. For me, I, I've been there. And but there's a real peace found in a relationship with God through His Son Jesus. There is a real peace available when we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead on the third day resides in you if you're a believer. And if you're not, all you have to do is call on him. Call on him wherever you're at, and he will respond. I can guarantee you, if you'll call on him, he'll respond. I dare you to try him. Rely on that peace. Get into the word. Find people around you that have walked through the season that you're in, the, the things that you've gone through, and connect with those people. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. Find a local pastor, a local minister, uh, different groups. One of the things I do is help a group called Reboot Recovery. We have small groups around the country. We're steadily deploying these groups around the country. Uh, and I think there's some in Canada uh, st- deploying these groups around the country where we are removing the barrier of isolation because that's so dangerous. So having that courage to take a step and say, I need help. And I have a lot of officers that reach out to me from all over the country and Canada, Germany. And uh, it's important that we we're willing to get over that initial. I don't want to talk to anybody about this. And uh, so that we can move forward. And, and it's just it's important to have that and understand the power of faith and resiliency. Now, you mentioned reaching out to a pastor, Adam. No battles we face should ever be fought alone. No man or woman is an island. What should we know about choosing confidence and mentors that include our spouses or friends or pastors, like you mentioned earlier? I think it's important to look at people who are around you have, who have been through something. Look at somebody and the resilient spirit that they've displayed. They've been through some stuff. And you find the people that have been through some stuff and that are willing to love you through your stuff, that's what Jesus does. That's what he did. He met the woman at the well. He wasn't afraid of engaging drama and changing the narrative in the middle of it. He wasn't afraid of, of addressing death and pain and changing, the, and changing the tone of that conversation. Jesus did that. And so when we want to look for somebody, we want to look for somebody that's compassionate, somebody that's qualified, and what qualifies them is their resiliency, that they've overcome this stuff and that they're willing to talk to you and be confidential about it and uh, get you further help if you need it. Now, you're right that prayer and fasting can actually make us stronger warriors. Tell me more about that. Some things we can only overcome with prayer and fasting. And for the past several months, I have put out a national call across the United States. If, if you uh, aren't living under a rock and you see some of the events that are occurring uh, in, a, in America today, uh, you know that this is a season for the body of Christ to come, come to life, to awake the sleeping, sleeping slumbering saints. And, uh, and this should be a time of fasting and prayer for law enforcement. What it does is it removes us from our reliance upon our flesh and our own wisdom and knowledge. And it reminds us that our strength and our source comes from God himself. And it comes from a relationship with him. And when we take the time to rely on him and be intentional about trusting him and walking in what I call flashlight faith, you know, his word said that his word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. I call it flashlight faith. I can't see the whole path but I can see what's in front of me. And that's all he's called me to do is take the very next step. And that's all he's calling you to do is take the next step. Maybe it's the next step towards healing. Maybe it's the next step in in equipping yourself and preparing yourself for spiritual warfare. And fasting and prayer is a great way to do that. Now, training is also very important with anything for a new job or if you're an athlete preparing for a major sporting event. Adam, you say training should include Prayer drills. What are some of the elements of prayer drills? Oh my goodness! You think about you go through the go through the Psalms. Uh, you look at some of the Psalms that you know that, that that you have. David had some great prayers. So you think about how we uh, go through firing drills, or we go through shooting drills, and all of these uh, prayer drills that we talk about are listed in the book, and they're great resources. I'm not going to give them away, but I want to tip you out here. When you're when you're a, a first responder, law enforcement officer, whether you're in the military, and you're learning to shoot with a firearm or you're learning to operate different weapons, there's different drills you go through. You want to spend the time becoming familiar. You don't have to have complex, complicated, big words. You want to spend the time to become familiar 
and that it's part of everything you do. Just like when you breathe, there's tactical breathing to help you deal with panic attacks or anxiety or high stress. You want to, that to become part of who you are, become part of your everyday life that you have. That it doesn't matter what happens. That's your first. That's your first step. Now, sometimes we face multiple threats all at the same time. What's important to remember during those moments? Focus. Focus on the one who gives us victory. I'll tell you this. Uh, I had a I had a dream recently that I was hiding behind a really big rock, and it was a, a giant red rock. And I was hiding behind this rock, and there were uh, rounds being shot down where I was at from somebody down the road or down the range. And there were one round after another. And I remember hearing, be still. And be still, to me, meant I wasn't qualified. Initially, it meant I wasn't qualified to address the threat. But what it was, was God saying, be still, because I'm going to go take care of the threat down here so that when you move in your next mission of battle, you're moving forward in victory. So sometimes we have to understand that it's small, subtle changes, small, subtle adjustments, like if you're adjusting the scope on a firearm, it's not drastic changes, it's small, subtle changes that mean the difference between uh, a hit on target or completely missing your target. So understanding, like in that case, it wasn't that I wasn't qualified or wasn't ready. It was he was literally protecting my journey so that I could move forward in victory. Listen, listen when you pray. Listen to what his word says. He still speaks. His word is alive and well today. I wrote a book in 2017. It released in 2018. It's called Behind the Badge. It's a daily devotion for law enforcement. It's a bestseller in Canada and the United States. I wrote it three years ago. If you go and read some of the entries that are today, you would have thought that I had some kind of knowledge for what's going on today. That tells us his word, his word is alive and well, and it speaks life. Wherever you are, no matter what you're going through, go to that word and spend time in it daily. Adam Davis, former police officer and author of the book On Spiritual Combat, Thanks for joining me today from Alabama. Hey, thank you so much, Hal, for having me. You bet. On behalf of all of us here at PCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless. Thanks so much for watching.